Good evening, everyone. Uh, I would like to thank the, the organizers for allowing me to present today. Um, I would also like to thank everyone for being here and uh, for being engaged in breast cancer research. And um, I hope that this is, ends up being useful. So um, I probably don't need to highlight the importance of breast cancer uh, to this audience. Um, if we look at the statistics from the American Cancer Society, we know that a lot of women will be diagnosed with breast cancer. Um, they estimate that in 2016, it will be diagnosing approximately 250,000 women and 2,600 men in the USA. As you see on the diagram um, on the right over here, um, you see that the breast cancer is at the top of the list of estimated new cancers affecting women in the United States. The treatments for breast cancer consist of both local and systemic therapies, meaning something that is done at the site of the tumor to get rid of it, as well as uh, different therapies that you take um, afterwards. In terms of the local treatment, the thing that first comes to mind um, may be surgery. And within surgery, you have different options that are listed here. Lumpectomy plus whole breast irradiation, lumpectomy plus partial breast irradiation, a mastectomy, lumpectomy alone, or mastectomy plus reconstruction and irradiation. In terms of the systemic treatment options, um, you have your chemotherapy regimens, uh, biological or targeted agents. The most commonly heard about are the endocrine therapies and also immune stimulating regimens. Um, as you can see, I highlighted in red uh, the, the areas where myself as a radiation oncologist uh, gets involved in the treatment. Um, both Dr. Schnabel and Dr. Myers will talk about updates that were highlighted regarding chemotherapies and systemic therapies as well as surgery. But as a radiation oncologist, you can see that we are also a very important part of the multidisciplinary team and um, we, we can be involved in different settings. Because I have a mixed audience, I wasn't sure you know, who may be uh, familiar with what radiation oncologists do. Um, so I'll, I'll give a very brief explanation. You can see in the diagram, if this works, that um, it is showing a breast and there's a tumor uh, depicted in, in black. The first step, assuming that this woman goes for a breast conserving surgery, would be to take that out, um, you do an lumpectomy. After surgery is done, then um, the radiation oncologist comes into the picture. The first time we meet, we discuss radiotherapy options, uh, to look, and the goal of the treatment is really to lower the risk of cancer recurrence for, from mic microscopic residual disease that may be left behind even after the surgery. Um, then we plan your radiation treatment. The radiation um, is, is done from a machine similar to what is depicted um, on, your, on the right of the screen. Um, we monitor for side effects during the ra radiotherapy period, and then uh, we also become a very important part of your clinical uh, surveillance team. So the goals for this part of the, of the lecture would be to highlight um, different uh, studies that were um, mentioned at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium regarding radiation oncology topics. Um, Basically, I've divided them into three main areas that were highlighted. The first one has to do with improving the convenience of radiotherapy. The second one, um, approaches that are being done to tailor and personalize the use of radiotherapy. And then um, some very interesting uh, studies looking at serious potential side effects from radiotherapy that are very important to keep in mind, specifically looking at secondary cancers and um, mortality that could come not from breast cancer, but from side effects from breast cancer, from radiation. So regarding the first topic, improving uh, convenience of radiotherapy, there was a very interesting talk by um, a preeminent radiation oncologist, Dr. Harris, uh, talking about critical decision-making in radiation therapy. A very um, interesting, and actually we're very happy to see this trend uh, that we've been observing for some time, is that uh, the rates of recurrence of the cancer coming back um, for early stage breast cancers uh, treated with breast conserving surgery and, and radiation have been going down uh, through the years. So the, if, you, if you see, if you take a look back in the 1980s, um, the risk was low. It was a hovering a little bit over 10%, then by the 1990s, 
Um, it was around uh, 6%, 7%. And in the 2000s, um, it really has gone down below 5%. So because we're doing so well uh, with these treatments, um, we really then want to find a way to make them more convenient uh, while maintaining the efficacy of these treatments. So one of the strategies is to make this radiation uh, a little bit easier to, a little bit more palatable, right? And one way to do that is to shorten the, the radiation schedule. The conventional schedule, which is uh, described at the top, it involves a long period of time where you have to come for the radiation treatments. The yellow rectangles in this case indicates the days of the weeks when you actually have to come for your radiation treatments. In the standard regimen, it takes um, anywhere from five to six weeks. The hypofractionated schedule, which means the shorter schedule, you see that the rectangles are wider because actually the dose of radiation is a little bit higher. Um, and by doing that, we can shorten the radiation uh, tr whole treatment period from five to six weeks to only th uh, three weeks. You may be aware of this article that came out in the New York Times actually about a year before the San Antonio conference. So this came out in, in December of 2014. And um, it was titled, Lone Radiation Treatments Called Unnecessary in Many um, Breast Cancer Cases. Um, this article was highlighting a study that was done looking at how many patients that were eligible for the shorter schedule were actually getting treated with a shorter schedule. And unfortunately, only about one in three patients um, was, was getting the treatment, uh, the shorter treatment, which was you know, very unfortunate. So it was very encouraging to see in the San Antonio conference that they showed additional data supporting the equal outcomes of the shorter regimen, the hypofractionated versus the longer regimen, and also um, that it may actually lead to less side effects than the longer regimen. So this new evidence is shown here. So it's really coming from three studies that um, one of them is ongoing and uh, another one, the other two actually have been published uh, together in 2015. And they show new evidence showing that acute toxicity uh, was less and quality of life was improved um, using these shorter schedules. They're looking at acute toxicity, that means that the side effects that patients experience during um, their treatment, dermatitis, dermatitis is a skin reaction, breast pain, fatigue, all of these um, side effects were lower with the shorter regimens. In terms of quality of life, which we assess by asking patients to fill out questionnaires, um, they also seem to be better with the shorter regimens, which makes sense less fatigue, less trouble meeting family needs or any other responsibilities such as you know, people that were being able to um, go to work. A second strategy to make the radiation therapy component um, more convenient is to reduce the amount of actual breast uh, treated. We call that accelerated partial breast radiation or APBI. And um, similar to, as I mentioned before, you see a conventional schedule takes uh, a total of six weeks, a hypofractionated schedule takes three weeks. The partial breast um, strategy is actually the most convenient because you can get it done in only five treatments. So within a, a week period, you can um, complete this treatment. It can be done with different, many different techniques. I'm highlighting here the one that we use um, uh, pretty frequently at NYU. It requires the use of an immobilization bore where the patient lies. Um, through this hole, the breast comes down as illustrated in this picture. And the concept is that in, instead of treating the whole breast, you only end up treating uh, a part of the breast, hence the partial breast irradiation uh, name. So a study that was highlighted at the conference um, was this uh, randomized controlled trial, a phase three clinical trial that was done in Europe that showed that um, when women get randomized, meaning that a computer chooses if that woman gets whole breast radiation versus the partial approach, um, they found that they were very, very comparable in terms of the, the risk of the cancer coming back. So in these graphs, in the vertical axis, they're measuring local recurrence or the risk of the cancer uh, coming back. The median follow-up, um, was seven years, and you see the years as they go by after the cancer treatment on the horizontal axis. And you see that um, when we're looking at either local recurrence on, on the left or um, disease-free survival on the right, um, those curves, the red one being the partial breast and the blue one being the whole breast, are very similar. So 
In a certain group of women, so those women that have early stage breast cancer, hormone receptor positive, treated with hormonal type of therapy, these two strategies appear to be very similar and um, the partial breast irradiation option obviously is more convenient, so um, it's something that uh, continues being examined. And at NYU, we actually have trials going on uh, regarding this. The second topic has to do with tailoring or personalizing the use of radiotherapy. And there was a very interesting talk by Dr. Timothy Whelan from Canada on this subject. So something that um, was highlighted was the fact that um, breast cancers, even though we call all breast cancers breast cancer, they actually have uh, different subtypes. They, they can be, if you, if you will, classified um, by many different features, either the pathology results that you get from that pathological report or um, even more precisely by looking at the blueprint of, of those cancer cells, the DNA of the, of, of, and how the DNA is being expressed in those cancers. And, um, we can, for example, talk about this molecular or biological subtypes. The names are on the left over there. They, um, they are luminal A, luminal B, HER2 positive, luminal HER2, and triple negative. If you have looked at a, a pathology report from breast cancer, you'll see that typically gets classified um, by the ER status, the PR status, or the HER2 status. Those are receptors on the surface of, of the cancer cells. And they, uh, along with other features such as grade, can be cor correlated with these biological subtypes. You may have heard of tests such as Oncotype or ProSigna, which can predict the benefit of chemotherapy when you're faced uh, with a cancer diagnosis in an early stage hormone receptor positive um, setting. So the question that we're trying to address is, um, if, if, if there is actually a subgroup of patients, maybe the luminal A patients, where radiotherapy actually may be omitted and may be omitted in a safe manner, because maybe not all patients that are treated with breast conserving surgery actually need breast radiotherapy. So one of the studies that was highlighted uh, was uh, this study actually from British Columbia, where they selected women that had very low risk features. So they had to be older than 60. They had to have tumors that were less than two centimeters or up to two centimeters, low grade tumors that had that classification that I mentioned before, luminal A. And um, when all of these women were treated with tamoxifen, which is a type of hormonal therapy, but half of them got radiation and half of them didn't. And what they observed was that actually in both groups, both the yellow one that didn't get radiation and the blue one that got radiation, the risk of uh, the cancer coming back was very, very uh, low. So it opens the possibility of actually omitting radiation in some groups and there are current cl open, currently open clinical trials um, at, for example, the Dana-Farber Institute and University of Michigan, where based on this risk classifications, uh, patients are actually not getting um, radiation af after their breast conserving surgery. We're actually uh, looking into being some of the, one of the institutions that are participating in these studies. The, um, Another aspect of personalizing the use of radiotherapy that was discussed had to do with ductal carcinoma in situ, which is another um, hot topic in terms of trying to find ways to manage it without over-treating patients. And um, a study that was highlighted, actually presented in a poster format in the, in the conference, was um, a population-based um, study where a patient prognostic score was calculated for DCIS. And um, the calculation was based on these, these factors mentioned here, age, size of the DCIS, histology, meaning the, the grade of the tumor. And by putting all of this together, you can come up with a score. And what they found was that if the score was low, actually the benefit of radiation uh, was not as high as if the, uh, the score was high. And without going into the details of um, how this is calculated, basically, if you have something to this direction of the, of the horizontal axis, radiation therapy is a benefit. So for scores that are four, five, six, they saw more of a benefit than for lower scores. So this is useful when we're meeting with patients and trying to decide what to do um, after a diagnosis of DCIS. Is it worth going through the radiotherapy, both for the time investment, potential side effects, um, or is it not worth it? Is it okay to just have the surgery and be compliant with your, with your screening. 
The last thing I'll present is uh, this very interesting study that came from the United Kingdom where they looked at late side effects uh, of breast cancer radiotherapy, particularly looking at secondary malignancies, so the, the possibility of the radiation that we use actually causing uh, another cancer, or non-breast cancer mortality, specifically by effects on the heart. And it's a very powerful study because they actually did a meta-analysis where they looked at 75 trials and they were able to compile data for over 40,000 women. So the, the, the punchline is that um, if they, the data that they, they obtained shows that smoking is, as expected, um, a very important, uh, very important uh, factor that affects the effect of radio, radiotherapy in terms of the risk of leading to a secondary lung cancer or ischemic heart disease, which means um, some sort of damage to the heart that can lead you know, ultimately to a heart attack, for example. So if you focus your attention first on patients that are non-smokers, the solid lines are um, the, the, the rates of either a lung cancer or heart disease um, in patients that didn't get radiation. So over the years, so as a, as a woman gets older, obviously the risk of either a lung cancer or a heart problem goes up. You notice that um, in the patients that are non-smokers, radiation, which are the, the hatchet lines over here, it does increase the risk, but very slightly. It goes from 0.5 to 0.8% for lung cancer. And here you're changing the risk you know, at age 80 from 1.8 you know, to 2% only. However, if the patient is a smoker, you see that at baseline, even without the radiation, her risk of a lung cancer by age 80 is much higher, almost 10%, and it goes up to about 14% with the radiation at this particular dose. Um, similarly, the, the, if the woman is a smoker, the risk of a heart problem at age 80 is higher, higher and also goes up by a higher magnitude with the, with the radiation. So these results overall are very encouraging so that in the modern era when we use newer technologies, we're very cognizant of the importance of protecting the heart, protecting the lung. We actually can achieve very low risk of these very serious uh, side effects. And this, this slide just highlights that if you look at the way that radiotherapy gets delivered through the decades, we actually have gotten progressively safer. So in color, this is a color wash representing how the radiation is getting distributed in the body. Obviously the target, these are axial images, this is the front, this is the back, this is your heart over here. And you see that as the years, the decades have gone by, the, the radiation actually gets more targeted. Um, in this day and age, actually, with the modern era, you can see that the radiation mean doses to both the lung and the heart has continued going down. So we actually expect that the risk of that, those lung cancers or heart disease are even lower today. So in summary, um, I think the, at the San Antonio Breast Cancer Symposium, the data that was presented was really um, supportive of an evolution in radiation therapy to make it more tailored and convenient. So basically creating a more personalized approach. Um, we, I showed you data show, showing the improved convenience of radiotherapy, either by using a shorter schedule or treating just the partial breast, which also allows for an even shorter schedule. In the topic of tailoring uh, the use of radiotherapy, you can talk about um, in the setting of low-risk early stage patients, um, such as elderly patients, which I didn't have time to talk about, low-risk biological subtypes like the uh, luminal A's uh, mentioned, low-risk DCIS, and also in, in another er area that I didn't have time to present, the setting of higher-risk early stage patients with a small number of positive notes. And finally, I mentioned that um, regarding second cancer incidence and um, mortality from heart disease, smoking status um, can determine the net long-term effect of breast cancer radiotherapy and smoking cessation as for many other reasons, health reasons is very important when patients are being diagnosed with a breast cancer injury with radiation. So here are some of the references uh, that I mentioned. Thank you so much for your attention. <laughs>